Hey, your science class. Welcome to another lecture on Chapter 2, Matter and Minerals. So geologists define a mineral as any material on Earth that checks off all these boxes here, that it's natural, inorganic, a solid, possess an orderly internal structure of atoms, and have definite chemical composition. All right, so if it meets all that criteria, it's a mineral. So let's take sugar, for example. Sugar is natural. It's a solid. It possesses an orderly internal structure of atoms, and it has a definite chemical composition. However, sugar is generated organically. I don't know if you've ever seen those sugar cane stalks. Um, that's where we get our sugar from, so it's created organically, so it's not <clears throat> inorganic. So Sugar, granulated sugar, is not a mineral. Salt, on the other hand, salt is natural. It's a solid, possesses an orderly internal structure of atoms and definite composition, NaCl, and it's, it forms inorganically. You can have uh, a, a kind of a shallow seaway and the water evaporate away and are left behind with salt. That's an inorganic process. So salt is a mineral, and its mineral name is halite. <coughs> Now a rock, on the other hand, a rock is any naturally occurring solid of mass of mineral or mineral-like matter together. So it can be composed of many minerals all put together, or one mineral, just uh, a bunch of the same mineral put together. So here's an example of a rock. This is granite. <coughs> this is the most common type of rock you'd find on the continental crust. It's volcanic in origin, and it's made up of kind of an amalgamation of a, a, a number of different minerals. And you might see this uh, in kitchen countertops. A lot of times it's polished, and then you can see all these different specks of different colors are different minerals. Um, and all of these crystallize directly from magma. So here is one mineral. This is quartz, and you can find it directly in places uh, like right here or here. Anything that's kind of light gray like that, that would be quartz. You can also find feldspar. This is another mineral, distinctly pink. And so all these pink areas here, you can find feldspar, a very common mineral. And then this dark mineral here is called hornblende. So it's like a kaleidoscope of different minerals is what makes up rocks. All right, but if we go and break down uh, minerals into kind of the smallest indivisible uh, particle. Uh, let's go down to the atomic scale. Let's talk about atoms. Those are the smallest particles of matter. They contain a nucleus with protons and neutrons. Protons in the nucleus are positively charged and they have mass. Neutrons are also found in the nucleus and they have mass but they have no charge or they're just neutrally charged. And then surrounding the atom are electrons, and electrons have negligible mass and they're negatively charged. Here is a kind of a rendition of what we think an atom looks like. Right here's the nucleus with protons and neutrons, and here are the orbiting electrons. But in reality, the electrons move so quickly and they behave erratically that it's kind of a we refer to it as an electron cloud, um, and they kind of jump from orbitals sometimes. So it's very difficult to kind of pinpoint them. Plus, they're so small. <coughs> so Really, it's an electron cloud. OK, so here's some review. Atomic number is just the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. And that really determines the chemical nature of that atom. Its behavior, its chemical behavior, is determined by how many protons are found in the nucleus or its atomic number. <clears throat> An element are all atoms of the same number of protons kind of grouped together and they'll all have the same chemical and physical properties. And scientists uh, kind of organized all the different elements into a useful table called the periodic table. Um, and there are over 90 naturally occurring elements, and there are a few kind of synthesized elements. Here it is, here's a periodic table of elements. <clears throat> and the way it's arranged, they arrange them in columns. Okay, so here's column number one, Right, here's two. Then we jump over all these, skip a few, three, four, all right, all the way to column eight. And the reason why that's important is because all of these uh, elements, like 
in column one, for example, hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, these all have very similar chemical behaviors. Okay. Group two elements also have very similar similar chemical behavior. Okay. Um, they have different uh, protons in the nucleus, but it has to do with electron configuration, which we'll go over in a second. Okay. Um, these guys in the middle, these are called transition metals, and they behave differently. The electron orbital here is the d orbital, which allows kind of electrons to kind of move in freely. So it's the uh, behavior is a little more complex here. Okay. <coughs> then over here, these are the uh, noble gases. This is group eight. They don't bond with anything, and that's because they have eight electrons in their outer shell, and they fulfill the octet rule. And what the octet rule essentially is. Um, atoms will tend to gain, lose, or share electrons until they fill their outermost electron shell. And we refer to that as the valence shell. The valence shell uh, is the outermost electrons, and those are the electrons that will uh, interact with other atoms to form chemical bonds. Okay, And chemical bonds are essentially the transfer or sharing of electrons to achieve eight electrons in that outer shell. That is balance that's the lowest energy state, and that's what really drives chemical reactions. In nature, in your room, in your car, in your wherever you're listening to this lecture, uh, there are atoms bonding together and kind of moving down to the lowest possible energy state in, in the form of chemical bonds. The same thing goes with minerals. Minerals will bond, or atoms will bond together to form minerals at the lowest energy state. Um, and that's what really drives those reactions. And so a number of different chemical bonds can form, uh, one of which uh, is called ionic bonds. And ionic bonds are where you have one atom that gives up one or more of their valence electrons to the other atom. Okay. Um, and what ions are, ions are positively or negatively charged atoms. So what happens with an atom is that if they lose an electron, right, they're losing an electron that has a negative charge, so they have more protons than electrons, then they become positively charged. If they, if they gain an electron, they gain a negative electron, right? They'd be uh, negatively charged as a result. And so what happens is oppositely charged ions will attract each other to form ionic bonds. Okay, so here's an example. Here's sodium chloride, or NaCl. Okay, so here's the sodium atom, Na has 11 protons and 11 electrons, okay? And <clears throat> because it's in the first column of the periodic table, it has one electron in its valence shell. So a lot of times it just chooses to lose that electron because if it loses that electron, then its outer shell is uh, complete with eight electrons. Um, the only problem is uh, then it's, um, it's not charge balanced, meaning that it has more protons than electrons so it's a positively charged sodium ion, okay? <clears throat> On the other side of the periodic table, column seven is chlorine. Chlorine um, just needs one electron. It has seven electrons in its outer shell, and it just needs one electron to fulfill the octet rule. So a lot of times it'll pick up that electron, okay? So the electron that came off of the sodium atom comes over here jumps into the chlorine atom, and now the chlorine atom has 18 electrons versus 17 protons. There's a charge imbalance, and then the chlorine is negatively charged. Okay, so that's a negatively charged ion. Opposites attract. Right? They put up their dating profiles, and boom, they form a chemical bond, and that is salt. And here, down to the uh, atomic structure, it forms these this uh, cubic lattice, and that's why we see kind of granulated salt. That's table salt, NaCl, also known as halite. It's mineral name. Okay, another type of bonding is covalent bonding. Here, ions aren't present. It, here, it's more of like a sharing of the valence electrons. A lot of times, carbon will form uh, covalent bonds because it has four electrons in its outer shell, and you need eight. So it's kind of like, should we give up four or take four? So how about we share four with another carbon atom and form a covalent bond? That's typical of covalent bonding. The example here in the book uh, is uh, two hydrogen atoms. They have just one electron in their outer shell. The first electron shell only needs two electrons to fulfill the octet rule. So uh, when they share these two electrons, they both fulfill the octet rule. 
So one proton plus one proton plus one electron plus one electron. Everybody's happy covalent bond. That's the H2 molecule. Now, covalent bonds in nature uh, tend to be uh, stronger than ionic bonds. Ionic bonds can break down pretty easily. Like salt, like if you've ever put salt in water, you can just kind of mix it up in water and it'll dissolve away. Why? Because the water molecules will rip apart that uh, ionic bond pretty easily. Okay, metallic bonds, this is the last type of bond. Here, this is a little different. Um, here, they do contain ions kind of uh, bonding together, but a lot of times it involves larger atoms, metallic atoms. Uh, and here, um, because it's the d orbital, uh, the electrons here are allowed to kind of flow freely throughout the entire structure. So here we have some closely packed large and heavy metallic ions put together. And what happens is these electrons can kind of move through freely uh, atom to atom. Okay, so think of it as like a sea of moving electrons free floating through the entire structure of that metal. Okay. That's why um, metals uh, can conduct electricity, right? If you um, stick something metallic into an outlet, you're going to get shocked. Please don't do that. That's not a good challenge. Um, that's why we use copper to wire our homes uh, and, and uh, the electric current in our homes because copper is metal and it's electrically conductive because copper metallically bonds with itself. And in reality, in nature, um, the minerals that we find on Earth uh, are a combination of uh, covalent and ionic bonding. Really, it's kind of like nothing strictly just covalent or just ionic. Sometimes there's kind of like a gray area in between. That's what makes up minerals. All right, let's talk about the properties of minerals. Some of the optical properties of, of minerals. Um, luster, if you're holding a mineral in your hand, Luster is how light reflects off its surface, and that changes with every different type of mineral. And we have uh, different definitions of how light can bounce off of it. Um, minerals, a lot of times minerals will have different color, okay? But color is not a very reliable tool to um, be able to diagnose what type of mineral you're looking at, because color can vary depending on chemical composition. So. Um, it might not be a, a good way to determine what the mineral is based on just color. A more reliable method is streak. Streak is um, kind of sc uh, scratching the mineral against the porcelain plate and taking a look at its powder, the color of its powder. So it's the mineral in its powdered form. Okay. Then also whether or not the mineral can transmit light if it's opaque or see-through. So here's an example of luster. Okay. This is this mineral is called galena. Galena is made up of lead, very heavy metal, okay, and sulfur, okay. <clears throat> if you were to hold this in your hand, you would notice it's very heavy. It has uh, very very high density, and what you'll also notice is that it has a very metallic shine to it. We call that metallic luster, okay. So that's the type of luster that galena exhibits. All right. If it's not a fresh galena piece, it'll look like this over here, kind of dull. All right, now here's the example of color. Color can be uh, unreliable due to variations, very small variations in trace elements in the chemical structure uh, of these minerals. Fluorite, for example, <clears throat> can come in a variety of colors. Light purple, deep dark purple, yellow, light green. Okay, quartz. I'm sure you've seen these before. Pure quartz is kind of clear or white. There's milky quartz, there's rose quartz, there's amethyst here, tiger's eye. A lot of different types of or colors or variations of quartz, but they're all the same mineral. They all have the same formula, SiO2. Every single one of these here is the same mineral despite the differences in color. Here's another example. This is beryl. Maybe you stayed up late on QVC wanting to buy a nice mineral, 2 a.m. or something. Um, the, like uh, Aquamarine right here is the same mineral as emerald. They're both beryl. Beryl is its mineral name. It's kind of scientific name. 
and it has the same chemical formula, uh, beryllium, aluminum, silica, and oxygen. The only difference is emerald um, really trace amounts, really small amounts of chromium or vanadium. Have they Both these elements have uh, are, are similar in terms of ionic size and charge with aluminum, and so they can substitute in for aluminum in this formula in very small amounts. And because of that, because of the small trace amounts of chromium and vanadium, that'll change the color of the mineral. And then we refer to this as a gem quality mineral called emerald. Okay, so there's aquamarine and emerald. They're just different varieties of the same mineral. Okay, here's the streak. Here's a picture example of it. This is uh, pyrite. This is fool's gold. Okay, it looks like gold, um, but if you scratch it along the streak plate, you'll you'll get a gray streak, whereas real gold won't leave a gray streak, and that's how you can tell the difference between pyrite and gold. And gold is a lot heavier than pyrite as well. That should be an easier indicator. Okay, crystal habit has to do with uh, the shape a mineral grows into under ideal conditions. Okay, so in an environment deep underground, uh, if uh, magma is slowly cooling down and minerals are growing from that magma, or if groundwater is moving through crevices in the rock, it'll start kind of crystallizing certain minerals. And under those I ideal environments, the minerals will take a certain shape, okay, under ideal conditions. Here's a, a cubic type habit, kind of like halite or salt, will always grow in the same cubic structure because that's the definition of mineral, that's its crystal habit. All right, other minerals will grow into this bladed shape, okay? Quartz kind of grows in a kind of prismatic, I'm gonna try to, oh God, that's not a <laughs> prismatic shape. Uh, okay, that's supposed to look like a prism, terrible. Uh, but anyways, that's prismatic. This is asbestos. This comes in this fibrous material. Um, this is dangerous. If you breathe this, uh, it could give you mesothelioma. We used to use it as um, insulation in attics and in buildings no longer. All right, so that's, that's fibrous habit. So under ideal conditions, minerals will always grow into the same crystal shapes. Okay. Then uh, a lot of geologists take a look at mineral strength in order to kind of uh, determine what the mineral is, okay? Um, mineral strength essentially is, is how easily minerals break or deform, okay? And that's determined by the kind of bonds that they form at that atomic level, okay? And there are a, a number of different ways to describe mineral strength. One is hardness. Hardness is the ability to resist scratching or abrasion. Cleavage, it's a real term. Cleavage is the tendency to break along kind of planes of weak bonding. I'll show you pictures. And fracture goes hand in hand with that. Some minerals will cleave into nice flat surfaces. Other minerals will randomly fracture, okay? Um, and then tenacity is just um, a, a mineral's resistance to cutting, bending, and breaking, okay? And when I mention specific gravity, that's the mineral density. So here, here's the hardness scale. The hardness scale is just uh, the Mohs hardness scale is arbitrarily giving, uh, assigning numbers to different known minerals from one to 10, one being the softest and 10 being the strongest. Uh, the softest mineral that we use for reference is talc. You might be familiar with this. Talcum powder, maybe you've gotten a close shave at a barber shop or um, Johnson & Johnson baby powder used to be talcum powder. That's the uh, really soft powder that you can put uh, on your skin, okay? Uh, it's also a lot of times used in makeup, ladies, so uh, sometimes you have talcum powder there. Well, talc talcum powder is really soft, okay? Uh, a better example, something you may be more familiar with is gypsum. Gypsum has a hardness of two. This is what, what uh, drywall is made of. I don't know if you've ever seen drywall, you can kind of, kind of punch through or you know, put holes in pretty easily or kind of easily scratch it down or polish it down if you want. Um, that's really soft. Gypsum uh, in its kind of natural form, you can scratch it with your fingernail. Your fingernail has a hardness of 2.5, so it'll scratch gypsum, okay? Some of the harder minerals, quartz, a very well-known mineral, that's 
uh, hard, relatively hard, hardness of seven. Um, corundum, its gem quality is ruby. Okay, so uh, uh, this is one of the hardest minerals, naturally forming minerals is corundum. But by far the hardest mineral is diamond. Okay, that has a um, hardness of 10. Diamond will scratch all of these minerals. Okay, um, a lot, that's why a lot of times you'll see uh, like saws that are used to kind of cut through rock or drill bits that, that drill holes in the ground are coated in lab created diamond dust. That helps abrade the materials because diamond is so hard. And if you look at it on an absolute scale, not an arbitrarily kind of one number assigned form of uh, you know mineral hardness, diamond is four times stronger than corundum. Corundum has an absolute hardness of about 20, okay, and then diamond's about 80, all right? So diamonds really are the strongest mineral, naturally occurring mineral on Earth. And the reason why geologists have developed the relative scale uh, of hardness, or the most scale of hardness, is because there are materials that you know what the hardness is, right? A glass, a streak plate, which is this right here, um, a wire nail or a copper penny. Um, when you find one of these minerals out in a mine or something, you can um, use these materials to determine how hard that mineral is and then narrow down what that mineral could be based on its hardness. Okay, cleavage is how a mineral breaks. So geologists essentially just grab minerals and just chuck them on the ground and break them open just to see how they break. Um, and cleavage is like when a mineral will break along a weak plane. Here's a mineral called um, muscovite. There's muscovite and biotite. This mineral forms in these sheets. See how he's holding this sheet? And you can peel back like pages in a book using this knife. You can go in there and just peel the different layers of this mineral. And the reason is because there are weak bonds in between the sheets. And so therefore, uh, this muscovite has one perfect plane of cleavage. Okay, so that's here. Muscovite, one perfect plane of cleavage. Um, this is feldspar here. Feldspar has two planes of cleavage. So if you were to break this mineral, it'll always break along two planes, and they're each at 90 degrees to one another. So that's 90 degrees. And here's the first plane of cleavage. Here's the second one. This is uh, the most abundant mineral in our crust, feldspar here. You often find it in granite. You can also have two planes of cleavage, but at a larger angle. This is at 120 degrees. Okay. So here's cleavage plane one and cleavage plane two. And then here, Increasing uh, halite has three planes of cleavage along with calcite, but halite has it at 90 degrees, so one, two, three. So if you were to break a large piece of salt, it'll break along these planes, and they're each at 90 degrees to each other. Calcite's a little different. Calcite uh, has three planes of cleavage at 75 degrees, so it creates this kind of rhombus shape, which is really cool. And then here, this is fluorite. Fluorite has four planes of cleavage. All right, there are other properties of minerals that can be used to identify them. Um, some minerals have very distinctive properties. You can identify minerals literally by tasting them. Uh, geologists do that. They'll just put minerals in their mouth and be like, hmm, that's definitely salt. That's halite. Yeah, because salt tastes, halite tastes salty, right? Smell, sulfur is a mineral, and it's kind of a kind of mineral form. It's uh, native element form and it stinks, right? So uh, you can determine what that is based on its smell. Elasticity, uh, malleability. Gold is uh, malleable, meaning that you can like hammer it out to very thin sheets uh, and is very flexible. Um, some minerals show what we refer to as double refraction and it bends the light so you can kind of see double. I think I have a, an image coming up there. You can see it. Some minerals are uh, magnetic. Uh, and so you can um, determine what they are based on the, the magnetism that they uh, create. Um, some minerals feel soft and soapy. Uh, you can use th the way they feel. Graphite, for example, that's pencil lead. It feels very greasy, and you can definitely identify that, but just just by feeling with it. And then you can get a you know get chemistry involved and put hydrochloric acid on certain minerals, and if there's a reaction, then you would know it's calcite.
Here's the double refraction. Calcite uh, bends light so that uh, it's see-through, and then you'll see double. It's like beer goggles or something. And then this is effervescence. This is hydrochloric acid uh, hitting this mineral, and then it'll create a reaction. Carbon dioxide and water are the byproducts, and it'll start fizzing, almost like uh, uh, like a soda can, uh, like um, carbonated water kind of bubbling out. So it creates a reaction. That's a way of identifying calcite. Okay, so let's identify the different mineral groups. Um, there are really just eight major players uh, in terms of uh, elements that are present that create the vast majority of minerals. Here they are, just oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. Here are their relative abundances in the crust. It's mostly oxygen and silicon. This makes up almost two-thirds of the entire crust. Okay, the crust is the outer layer, upper layer of the Earth, ranges in thickness between 7 and 70 kilometers. And then here are the relative abundances of all those other eight uh, ele elements, uh, aluminum, calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium, and iron. Okay, this small area here makes up everything else, only 1.5%. But even that small amount, these make up the vast majority of economic minerals that are very important to us. So let's talk about the major mineral groups. The silicate, the silicate minerals are the most common mineral group. That's because they contain silicon and oxygen, right? Those are the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. And what they do is they often uh, form these, uh, what we call uh, silicon tetrahedra which are four oxygen atoms that surround a much smaller silicon atom, okay? And that tetrahedra, which is kind of shaped like a pyramid, right, silicon here, and there's one, two, three, and then there's a fourth one in the back on the other side. I can't three-dimensionally draw, but um, they form a lot of different silicate structures, okay? So here it is, yeah, much better. So here's the silicon tetrahedron, and when they link up with other silicon tetrahedron, we call that polymerization. Okay, so you can have a, a number of these all bond. The, the oxygens from different ones will bond in all the other corners and start to form really complex uh, structures. So here are some common silicate minerals and the different structures. Olivine, this is the most abundant mineral in the Earth's mantle. Okay, it's this distinctly green mineral. That's a single tetrahedra, meaning that uh, it's a single tetrahedra and then it has uh, positively charged ions on each end of uh, those oxygen atoms. Um, this is augite, a dark mineral, and it forms a single chain. So those tetrahedra kind of link together as a single chain. Um, amphibole are double chain. Okay, so it's basically two of these together. Um, and then these are the sheet silicates right here. So this is biotite and muscovite. Remember, these are those minerals with the perfect plane of cleavage. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is because of the sheet structure. So these are really strong bonds in between all these silica tetrahedron, and that's why uh, each of those sheets can be ripped apart because in between those sheets are weaker bonds. So the cleavage or those physical properties of minerals are directly um, uh, affected by the chemical, uh, uh, the subatomic structure and bonding of those minerals, or the structural components. Potassium feldspar and quartz, they're both very hard minerals. Um, quartz has a hardness of seven. I think feldspar has a hardness of six. Um, they form the three-dimensional network where uh, these are all bonding with each other, and <clears throat> that what, that's what makes these minerals very hard. Okay, so let's talk about the common light silicate minerals. Um, so Silicates are kind of grouped into two major groups, light silicates and dark silicates. Okay, light silicates, like the name implies, that means they're light in color and they're less dense, meaning that they're lighter in terms of weight. The most common is the feldspar group. They, they form their structure, that three-dimensional network. So they're uh, kind of hard, hardness of six mostly. They're the most plentiful minerals in the Earth's crust. If you're ever at a dinner party and you see some granite countertops and someone's like, oh, you took Earth science class? And like, what's this mineral here? Just say feldspar. There's a 50% chance that you're right. Okay.
potassium feldspar, so K feldspar with potassium in it, um, that is that kind of pinkish colored mineral. I think I have pictures in the next slide. And then plagioclase feldspar contains either sodium or calcium in different amounts because they kind of substitute for one another. Okay, so here is uh, potassium feldspar. This is that K feldspar. Um, forms that kind of pink mineral, very common in granite. And then this is uh, plagioclase feldspar, more common in uh, basalt and then other uh, silicate rocks. Okay. Then there's quartz. Quartz is the second most abundant mineral in the Earth's crust. Very hard, hardness of, of seven, and that's because of the three-dimensional network of tetrahedra. Um, it's entirely uh, made up of silicon and oxygen. Its chemical formula is just SiO2. Very simple, just silicon and oxygen, okay? And the impurities that you find in it, the small trace amounts of other metals that can go into that chemical structure is what gives it all the different colors. Here's rose quartz, amethyst, milky quartz, smoky quartz. Okay, so there are a lot of varieties of quartz. Other common light silicates, uh, we have muscovite. That's part of the mica group, okay? These, uh, arrange, these are the uh, sheet silicates, so that's why they have that excellent cleavage like you see here. Okay, There are other light silicates, clay minerals. They're also arranged in sheets, um, and they, uh, they originate from chemical weathering of feldspar. Okay, let's talk about the dark silicates now. So now so there are light silicates, and now there are dark silicates. Dark silicates are darker in color, and also have higher specific gravity, meaning that they're heavier. They have higher density. And the reason is, is because they contain more iron and magnesium, okay? Iron and magnesium are heavier metals, and that's what weighs them down, and that's what colors them, these kind of darker colors. Okay, so the olivine group, these are the single tetrahedra uh, um, structure, okay? Kind of makes them hard. Uh, they have fracture as a result, just like quartz. Um, these are found in volcanic rocks on the ocean floor um, and also the mantle. The mantle makes up the majority of the Earth's interior. And this here is a mantle rock. This is a mantle peridotite. It's beautifully green. It's encased in volcanic rock because this was erupted and brought to the surface. And we're able to kind of sample the mantle, but it's made up of a lot of different olivine and other dark silicates like pyroxene and spinel. So pyroxene, like I mentioned, is another type of dark silicate. Uh, these are found in basalts, also in peridotite. They're kind of a, a darker mineral. The next slide, I've got pictures. And then there are amphiboles. Um, these are found in many igneous rocks. I'll show you the pictures. Oh, I don't have pictures. Okay, trust me. The book has pictures for sure. Um, biotite is also part of the mica group, but basically it's just uh, muscovite with um, more uh, uh, heavier uh, metals in them like magnesium or iron. That's what gives it that dark color, but it still has one perfect plane of cleavage. Okay, And then there's garnet, which is right here. Garnet is beautiful, really dark red color. Uh, forms a, a crystal habit like a dodecahedron, which and then also you can find gem quality um, varieties of garnet, and we find them in a lot of metamorphic rocks. We'll we'll talk about what metamorphic rocks are in in a bit. Oh, here we go. There's hornblende. I knew I had a slide. Um, this is a peridotite where all would you where you'd find olivine. Uh, a lot of times you'll find augite in this as well. Here's another pyroxene. Hornblende and augite um, are, are dark silicate minerals. And then here's a, a nice garnet coming out of a metamorphic rock. Okay, so there are other important mineral groups. Um, there are these, are, we refer to them as non silicates, right? So we just talked about the silicates, they're the most common. They make up like 90% of the crust, okay? But the non silicates are also very important, they make up a smaller percentage of the crust. Um, but a lot of them have very important economic resources, okay? So we refer to all of them as non-silicates. And here are the different ones. They're, they're carbonates, halides, oxides, sulfides, sulfates, and some native elements. Okay, so <clears throat> carbonates, which are found right here, if you look at this, um, these are important because they make up a lot of 
Portland cement and lime. So their economic use is very important. That includes calcite or dolomite. Here's their chemical formula. All right, so these are, uh, they're actually kind of uh, quite abundant uh, in the Earth's crust. Um, the halides are, uh, um, you, you find salt or fluorite are very common halides. Um, we use salt for a number of purposes, cure stuff and seasoned food, which makes it delicious. Uh, but fluorite we use in steel making, and we also use fluorite for fertilizer. Okay. The oxides are typically a metal bonded with oxygen. Okay. In this case, we have hematite, which is iron ore or magnetite. Here you can see paper clits attached to it because magnetite is magnetic. We also use it for pigment or abrasives. Sulfides are typically a metal bonding with sulfur. And this is where we have galena, like I mentioned before. That's our lead ore. There's also zinc ore. Um, calcopyrite is a sulfide. Um, copper or mercury. Um, when we create sulfuric acid, we use sulfides. Sulfates are um, gypsum and anhydrite. Gypsum we use for plaster. Um, we use a lot of anhydrite for uh, drilling mud. So these have important economic uses. And then the native elements are just um, native elements bonded to one another, like copper, like sulfur, like graphite or pencil lead, uh, diamonds, for example, silver. So we use these as trade, jewelry, electronic uh, conductors, gemstones, abrasives, pencil lead, um, and photography. So these have a, a wide range of uses, these non-important non-silicates. Uh, minerals, um, they're a non-renewable resource. And what that means is that the Earth has a fixed quantity of the minerals, okay? Oil, aluminum, natural gas, coal, those are all examples of things that are non-renewable. Um, renewable materials are things that can be replenished in a very short time span. Wind, right, is always gonna blow the water or corn that can be grown every year. But non-renewable materials, um, we have a certain amount of it. So for example, here, here's a, a Bolivian miner um, uh, collecting evap uh, evaporated water and left behind with a lot of salt. And uh, this is where we get our lithium for our lithium batteries and all the amazing devices that we use, like our phones and our laptops. And those mineral resources um, are often found in uh, ore deposits. What ore deposits are are just rocks that have a concentration of a certain economic uh, mineral in high enough concentrations that it's profitable to mine. Okay, so uh, these are areas where there are minerals that are useful to be extracted. Okay, um, and so economic factors can change. The price of certain commodities can lower or rise. If it lowers, might make it less profitable and mines will close down. But the things we use every day, things like our mobile phone, use a lot of different minerals and economic minerals. Uh, a lot of the electronics that we use and take for granted use a lot of gold, copper, tantalum, tungsten, and tin. This makes up all the complex mini uh, circuitry within your phone. Uh, and uh, that's what makes it work. And these are all non-renewable resources. And this is how we extract them. This is an aerial view of the Bingham Canyon copper mine in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, and so this is how we have to extract these resources in order to use them. Copper we use and wire our entire house uh, with electricity.